So dear friends, uh, Falterov Galer, welcome to this annual Corish lecture. Um, it's been a rather busy day here in the college. We've had a number of events and Henri Conferral just uh, uh, finishing uh, next door. So please forgive me as after the greeting, I, I should have to return to that duty. But it is wonderful to, um, uh, to see um, this uh, very venerable tradition of the Corish lecture by now. A, uh, continuing with the same vibrancy and uh, and uh, commitment from uh, from our from our colleagues as uh, as ever, it honours a, a wonderful Manuth um, uh, man really, uh, someone who gave his life to Manuth and who was uh, something of a, really of a legend around this this college and campus, who um, was great loyal. Um, uh, member of, of staff, but more than that, was it was someone who was part of the very fabric of Manoth, and it's it's delightful that we continue to honour his memory in this way every year by having speakers of the calibre of, 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 of Dr. Bartlett, whom we have here this evening. Um, you know, when the Cornish lectures first started, uh, the very first one was was done uh, tentatively while Monsignor Cornish was was still with us. But he was so uncomfortable by, by, by the idea of anyone celebrating anything that he had contributed that it was quietly put aside for about 10 years and, uh, uh, and then resumed again. Uh, but uh, he, he, he is someone certainly who is very worthy of honoring and remembering in this way. I have a very simple duty this evening and that simple duty is simply to welcome you. I know our, uh, our own Professor Ryan will uh, honour our special guest here, guest speaker this evening, separately. But may I also simply say a word of, of thanks and gratitude uh, to Professor Ryan for his industry, for his uh, uh, work in, in making an, an event like this happen, and also indeed for the, uh, the high profile which he gives to uh, ecclesiastical history here within the Faculty of Theology and within the Pontifical University. Uh, he's someone who is noted for his, for his industry, for his publications, and for his interaction with students. And uh, that bespeaks someone who is simply um, dynamic and, uh, and, and always interested and always engaged and, uh, and, and, and ready to bring his subject to a wider audience. So, Salvador, thank you very much for your, um, your, your work in organizing this evening. Um, truth is, though, you haven't come to listen to me. So uh, a hearty welcome to one and all, and please enjoy this evening's proceedings. Thank you very much. Well, Balo Yir Ari Agus Vorget Falte, a quick Kalash to Farig, Manud Aranokoid, special to Sa. It's more an honor than an lector Sa, an lector special to Sa, a cur in old Dave. It's my great pleasure this evening to um, be able to introduce a scholar as distinguished as Professor Robert Bartlett, and it is a great privilege for us to host him here for the uh, Patrick J. Corish Lecture of 2015. Professor Robert Bartlett grew up in South London, and he read history at the University of Cambridge, and then went on to pursue his doctoral studies at Oxford University under Professor R. W. Southern. He is currently Ward Law Professor of Medieval History at the University of St. Andrews. He is also a Fellow of the British Academy and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Over the length of his career, Professor Bartlett has become widely known and widely respected for a series of landmark volumes in medieval studies. Most notably, perhaps, his award-winning 1993 volume, The Making of Europe, Conquest, Colonization, and Cultural Change from 950 to 1350. And this won the Wolfston Literary Prize for History and has been translated into German, Estonian, Polish, Japanese, Spanish, and Russian. Since then, he has published such titles as England under the Norman and Angevin Kings from Oxford in 2000, 
Also, The Hanged Man, a story of miracle, memory, and colonialism in the Middle Ages from 2005. The Natural and the Supernatural in the Middle Ages, which uh, came out of his, his, his delivery of the Wiles lectures. And most recently, why can the dead do such great things? Saints and worshippers from the Martyrs to the Reformation, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2013. This is a massive tome of nearly 800 pages of breathtaking scholarship, which takes the reader on a spellbinding journey through the history of the cult of the saints from the age of the Christian martyrs to the eve of the 16th century reformations. Here, perhaps more than anywhere else, does Professor Bartlett display his love of miracle stories, the topic of his presentation tonight. Always with an eye for the humorous and the entertaining, <clears throat> in one place in the volume, Professor Bartlett recounts how, when the canonization of Thomas Aquinas was finally approved, a disgruntled Franciscan, there can be disgruntled Franciscans, <laughs> A disgruntled Franciscan and long-standing opponent of his cause declared on the eve of the ceremony itself that he never wished to see the day on which such a man would be canonized. Fittingly, he was to have his wish granted, for by a stupendous and terrifying miracle of God, he was found dead the next morning. <laughs> However, despite Professor Bartlett's signature accessibility and light touch in his writings, this hardly masks the depth of his scholarship, which is evident throughout his work. The extensive bibliography to his most recent Saints volume runs to some 90 pages. Now this in itself would be impressive were it not for the further detail that over half of these pages are devoted to primary source texts the majority of them in Latin. This forensic examination of primary source texts has characterized Professor Bartlett's approach to scholarship over the course of his career. And yet, his facility for distilling this depth of scholarship and presenting it to large audiences is also well known. Thus, he's also written and presented three much acclaimed documentary series for the BBC. Inside the Medieval Mind from 2008, the Normans from 2010, which took him to Sicily, Istanbul, and Jerusalem, and the Plantagenets from 2014. Once when he was asked whether there is a secret to being engaging and clear for a general TV audience, while at the same time reassuring academic peers that you have not abandoned scholarly gravitas for frivolous celebrity, he quipped, no, I just go for frivolous celebrity. <laughs> However, uh, I think we all suspect the tongue-in-cheek nature of that last comment, for I would contend that here what we have is what might be called in scholarly terms the real deal. An individual whose capacity for wide-ranging and in-depth examination of his period and its sources does not burden either the reader or the viewer, but exhilarates them instead. And thus it is an enormous privilege to have you amongst us here this evening, Robert. Um, and we're greatly looking forward to hearing your thoughts on barbarous Latin snake saints and croaking crows, medieval miracle accounts as stories. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. It's, a, it's an honor to be invited to deliver a lecture in this uh, annual series named after Monsignor Corish. Um, as a medievalist, my own historical work uh, obviously concentrates on a period earlier than that that Monsignor Corish studied. Um, but I was enjoying the Irish Catholic Experience, his lucid study called the Irish Catholic Experience the other day when my wife came into the room and she is um, Irish, American and Catholic and looked at what I was reading and said, um, oh, so you've um, finally decided to try to understand me. <laughs> I don't know 
what the chances of that are. Um, but I was told that there might be some Catholics here tonight. I see some coming into the room right now, I think, yes. Um, so I'm not going to spend any time of an introductory nature on the cult of the saints. I'm rather presuming that there'll be perhaps more detailed knowledge in the audience than in the speaker on this occasion. So I'm going to get straight down to my topic, which is uh, miracles. Because among all the varied types of narrative that have come down from the Middle Ages, uh, accounts of miracles are one of the most abundant. Uh, they're found already, of course, in the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, uh, and they characterize the earliest hagiography, such as the seminal life of Martin of Tours. While the first surviving miracle book, consisting just of a collection of saints' miracles, uh, seems to be that of St. Stephen, composed in the 420s uh, and describing uh, 20 or so miraculous events stimulated by the arrival of the saints' relics in North Africa. Uh, thereafter, the tide of miracle narrative has never stopped flowing. Uh, it was possible for the French historian Pierre-André Sigal to base the analysis in his L'Homme et le Miracle of 1985 on 4,756 miracle accounts from 11th and 12th century France alone. Uh, in England, miracle stories were composed in the 8th century, then after a hiatus, again in the 10th century and subsequently. Uh, the miracles of William of Norwich, which I'll be mentioning later as well, uh, collected by the monk Thomas of Monmouth in the period 1150 to 72, numbered well over 100, the largest in, uh, English collection to that date, uh, but were quickly outstripped by collections of the miracles of Cuthbert and then Becket, whose two enormous compilations of the 1170s, numbering well over 600 miracles, have been called the most specular productions in the history of English miracle collecting. After the intrusion of papal canonization into the story, miracles collected for that purpose are also numerous. Uh, André Vaucher uh, used a sample of 1,800 of them for his magnificent study, uh, La Sainteté en Occident. The typical miracle account is a short narrative, often of a stereotyped nature. Uh, that is one reason these accounts are so suited to statistical analysis, such as Sigard's. And the examination of ailments cured, age and sex of beneficiaries, or distance travelled to the shrine has become a standard feature of scholarly investigation of miracles. This all helps create a picture of the social realities of the medieval cult of the saints. But there are other approaches, uh, and one that is particularly rich is to start with the fact that these miracle accounts are narratives and to study them as such. In her splendid book, Wonderful to Relate, Miracle Stories and Miracle Collecting in High Medieval England, published in 2011, Rachel Koopman stresses the swarms of stories that circulated in and around the monastic shrines of the time, and writes of the miracle collection as a defining genre and a major literary phenomenon that is essential for our understanding of orality, literacy, genre formation, literary Latin, and individual rhetorical ambitions. The indispensable task for a miracle account is to construe a sequence of events as a miracle. The crucial ingredient here is the invocation of the saint. A story that a young man swallowed a pin, thought he was going to die, ate some vegetables, and then threw up the vegetables along with the pin, would in itself only be mildly unpleasant. If, however, he had invoked Saint Modwenna of Burton-upon-Trent <laughs> when he felt ill, then the event would be classifiable as a miracle. The structure of the narrative itself creates the interpretation, which can then be strengthened further by rhetorical amplifications such as apostrophe to the saint 
or a doxology. But given that this is the minimal requirement, how else can we analyse these accounts? Starting from the point that miracle accounts were stories worked into shape by writers well versed in the conventions of narrative, what can guide our own analysis? Uh, tonight I will try out three approaches. The first suggests one possible general contrast that can be used to characterize the nature of miraculous narratives. The second looks at the building blocks of such accounts, narrative motifs with a close examination of one such motif. And the third with which I conclude is a, a, a case study of a particular story. So those are my three elements, the contrast, the analysis of motifs, and a particular case study. To begin with the general contrast, um, Aviad Kleinberg, the very distinguished Israeli historian of, of hagiography, wrote that every hagiographic work is an exercise in persuasion. Uh, and that is a perception that is generally and deeply true. Even the presence in a hagiographic text of doubters and critics, including sometimes beneficiaries, such as heads of monastic institutions, is intended ultimately to buttress confidence amongst the audience, as these doubters and critics are either silenced or satisfied. Uh, Richard Prior of Much Wenlock in the early 12th century was, we are told, unwilling to accept miracle stories easily. But after inquiring into a miraculous cure performed by Saint Milberger, who was enshrined in his own church, he rejoiced, elated at this new and unusual miracle. His doubts have been put in there simply to reinforce the ultimate vindication of the miraculous reality. But while all such writing was intended to demonstrate the sanctity of a man or woman, the meaning of that word demonstrate is not always exactly the same, having stronger and weaker implications. I will distinguish the weaker, more generally persuasive sense, calling that the literary approach, from the approach that sought to show that someone was a saint by more formal rules, calling that the forensic. I'm happy to consider other labels, but tonight I will use literary and forensic as my polarity. Hagiographers were always literate, of course, and often literary and learned. They wrote the same kind of prefaces as other writers with the same rhetorical commonplaces, the modesty topos, the plea that they are writing only at the request of their fellows or at the command of their superiors, the invitation to correct their errors, the assertion that they write only truth. These are the commonplaces of, of medieval rhetoric. They were sometimes masters, or much more rarely mistresses, of elaborate Latin style. If they were revising or recasting an earlier piece of hagiographic writing, they might well strike a self-satisfied note. Uh, even the shy and retiring Gerald of Wales trumpeted the superiority of his version of the life of St. David over what he calls the old and now virtually outdated version. In this work, the reader will find superfluities cut back, defects supplied, and clumsy phrases rewritten. These writers knew that they were aiming to produce top quality works of letters. But sometimes this concept of literary achievement might sit uneasily with other purposes of, writings about the, of writing about the saints and their miracles, other conceptions of what the form of a miracle account should be especially those that had a strong sense of what constituted proof. A small but very revealing example of the tension between the literary and the forensic conception concerns the matter of witnesses to miracles. Latin writers who saw themselves in a classical tradition might blanch at the inclusion of vernacular names, uh, especially Germanic ones. This self-denying ordinance could be applied to the names of those involved in miracles. Thus, when Theofrid, abbot of Exenach, wrote his verse life of St. Willibrod around 1100, uh, not only did he have to call the saint Willbrod to make the scansion easier, but also when mentioning the saint's punishments, 
or those who usurped churches' lands, he refused to commit to writing so many barbarous names. His contemporary, Osborne of Canterbury, omits the names of informants in his life of St. Alphage also because of their barbarousness. I consciously refrain from giving their names since I am unwilling to discolour the very beginning of my discourse with barbarous appellations. Likewise, William of Malmesbury, in his Latin translation of Coleman's Old English Life of St. Wolfstan, addressed to the monks of Worcester, admits, Brethren, I have not concealed from you that I have suppressed almost all the names of the witnesses, lest, their barbar lest the barbarity of their names should wound the ears of the fastidious reader. Examples could be multiplied. Latin writers with pretensions could and did choose to omit the names of witnesses to miracles on the grounds of their uncouthness. Yet such an omission could be hazardous if one encountered a more demanding canon of proof. Such awkward tension between two different ways of dealing with the testimony in miracle accounts is revealed in the work of the Cistercian Walter Daniel. Uh, Walter composed a life of Aelred, abbot of Rivaux, soon after Aelred's death in 1167, including in it, as might be expected, the accounts of several in vita miracles performed by Aelred during his life, mainly cures. But very soon after he sent his composition into the world, he found he was challenged and had to defend the way he had undertaken it. Two unnamed prelates doubted Aelred's miracles. And as a consequence, Walter was asked to give the names of witnesses to those miracles, which he had not done in the life. In the short but highly informative text that he wrote in response, known as the Letter to Morris, he did so, giving those names, though hardly with a good grace. Scarcely any hagiographer, he claims, gives the names of his sources. And it might surely have been enough, he laments, that he had said in the life that he had reported only what he had seen or what others had seen and told him about. Anyway, he adds, echoing a common trope, virtue is more important than the power to perform miracles. I marvel more at Aelred's charity than I would marvel if he had raised four people from the dead, four being uh, one more than Jesus's three. Uh, but his critics are satisfied only with proofs in words publicly proclaimed. And Walter duly lists the names of those who witnessed Aelred's miracles, dutifully going through them in the order in which they occur in the life. But he does this with a certain truculence. One of his comments is especially significant. His critics, he says, seem to equate the proof of virtue, virtus, and the proof of crime, crime, forensic witnesses. We are here around uh, 1170 in the heart of the formative period when the doctrine and practice of papal canonization were being hammered out. Uh, the first papal canonization of an English saint, Edward the Confessor, took place in 1161, uh, and the papal pronouncement that eventually came to embody the papal claim to monopoly of canonization, as found in medieval canon law, Aldivimus, dates to 1171-2. to two. The first Irish saint to be canonised uh, was Malachi of Armagh in 1190. By the pontificate of Innocent III, at the end of this short period, the process is clear. When Innocent authorised an inquiry into the sanctity of Gilbert of Sempringham in 1201, he expected to receive the sworn evidence of named witnesses, recorded in writing and authenticated with appropriate seals. Miracles and proof had always been paired, but for many long Christian centuries, the balance of opinion was that miracles constituted proof. They demonstrated sanctity, not that they required it. They were like witnesses testifying to sanctity. They were not themselves in the dock as they came to be after 1200. Walter Daniel had been pressured into giving the names of witnesses to miracles and felt that it was an unwelcome intrusion of a semi-judicial procedure. By 1200, those semi-judicial procedures were standard in canonization processes. 
the tension between literary and forensic purposes could hardly be more explicit. It is a shift that Rachel Koopsmans, who I just mentioned, also describes. The new forms of testing miracles are more like a bureaucratic process than a warm conversation with friends. Walter Daniel certainly felt he had been dragged from the congenial world of the latter into the colder light of the former. It was no longer possible to leave out the witnesses' names because they sounded uncouth and barbaric to Latinate ears. We should thus be aware of the context in which miracle stories were being written down and collected. Those for a new cult or a contested cult may, weigh, may well have a sharper probative tone than others. They will be closer to the forensic pole. And those of the later Middle Ages aimed at securing canonization will have a different feel from those circulating among gossipy and supportive confrères. And uh, incidentally, an issue that may be relevant here is the balance of types of miracle. It is often suggested that miracles of punishment are proportionately more important in the early Middle Ages and are dwarfed by miracles of healing in the later Middle Ages. And if this is true, then one explanation might be not that the saints had become kinder, uh, but that the more rigorous demands for witness testimony in the later period favoured healing over punitive miracles. Those healed by the saint would be happier to attest their cure than those harmed by the saint, uh, if indeed they survived. Uh, while fervent monks reporting the sudden deaths of their enemies might not be what papal commissioners were looking for, the forensic demands of the new outlook would then be shaping the very content of miracle accounts. I move on to my second subject, narrative motifs. Reg regardless of their place in this gamut from persuasive or literary to forensic, uh, all miracle accounts can be broken down into their narrative components. Uh, and it's clear that recurrent motifs are a fundamental building block of these little narratives. This family likeness of many miracle accounts was noticed by the Reverend Augustus Jessop in the preface to the life and miracles of St. William of Norwich, which he co-edited with the great paleographer uh, and ghost story writer M.R. James in 1896. When we can get over the long list of miracles, which even in their nauseous details have all a strong family likeness to one another, there still remains a very valuable element of social history, Jessup writes. Jessup was unusual at that time in perceiving the value of miracle accounts for social history. Uh, typical of Protestants of the time in regarding their details as nauseous, uh, and nothing other than perfectly perceptive in noting their family resemblances, their motifs. Um, motif analysis is a tricky business. Step one is, of course, the catalogue. And the classic example of the cataloguing of narrative motifs is the motif index of folk literature in six volumes, first published in the 1930s by the American folklorist uh, Stith Thompson. His method was exhaustively taxonomic. We read, for instance, of return from lower world up steep slope, return from lower world by being slung by bent tree, return from lower world on eagle, return from lower world on vulture, escape from lower world by magic, escape from lower world on miraculously growing tree, ascent from lower world on animal, escape from lower world on bird, escape from lower world on horse of lightning, escape from lower world by spiders. <laughs> Fairly exhaustive. Stith Thompson was a medievalist as well as a folklorist. Uh, his first publication in 1918 was Old English Poems, translated into the original meter. Uh, and he included in his motif index examples from medieval romances, although not from hagiography. In the preface to his vast catalogue, he explicitly invoked the analogy with the systems of classification employed by biologists. And he also made it clear that his job was listing, not interpreting. No attempt has been made to determine the psychological basis 
of various motifs or their structural value in narrative art. Presumably, these were tasks left to subsequent generations. The torch of motif classification was taken up by another American scholar who also combined interests in medieval literature and contemporary folklore, a great pioneer in the motif analysis approach to medieval miracles. C. Grant Loomis, whose book, White Magic, An Introduction to the Folklore of Christian Legend, appeared in 1948. Uh, Loomis, who spent most of his academic career in the German department at Berkeley, uh, studied both in Munich under Max Förster, author of, among many other publications, a series of nine articles entitled Beiträge zur Mittelalterlichen Volkskunde, Contributions to Medieval Folklore Studies, and worked with him on the sources of Aylfridge's li Saints' Lives, uh, and later at Harvard, where he wrote a dissertation on Old English Saints' Lives combining all this with being an active folklorist, serving for some years as editor of the journal Western Folklore. Western, in this case, meaning west of the Rockies. Loomis comments in his preface, a complete index of all the miracles which appear in Christian legend would be a useful and desirable work. No one could disagree with that. He adds, such a labor, it is likely, would exceed the usual lifespan of any patient compiler. Nor could anyone disagree with that. But his industry still commands respect. What he did do was work his way through the great collections, such as the Acta Sanctorum and Means, Patro Means Patrologia, and also a sampling of both medieval collections, such as Gregory of Tours' hagiography, and modern compilations, Plummer for Ireland, Reese's Cambro British Saints, for example, noticing recurrent narrative motifs, although excluding for comprehensible reasons the, the mere description of a miraculous cure. White Magic is a fairly slim volume, 250 pages, but it's based on fairly stout research. There are well over 1,500 saints listed in the Index of Saints. And if you want to lay your hands quickly on several examples of lions, friendly, or sunbeam supports objects, Loomis is your man. Or at least he was until the giant computerized database arrived, overshadowing him and his task as completely as the power loom did the hand loom. Loomis boldly chose to use both the term magic and the term folklore in his title. Neither of these is a simple or exact concept. And classifying Christian miracle as magic is controversial. Indeed, many scholastic thinkers of the Middle Ages make great efforts to distinguish and differentiate miracle and magic. They had less trouble with the concept folklore since this term was not invented until 1846, when it was a conscious neologism, championed by its inventor as a good Saxon compound, folk lore the law of the people. The 14th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica defines folklore as the traditions, customs, and superstitions of the uncultured classes in civilized nations. And the associations, implications, and connotations of the term lead directly to the long debates that took place about popular culture that characterized the later 20th century. Uh, debates embodied most memorably for scholars of hagiography in the first chapter of Peter Brown's book, The Cult of the Saints, with its critique of the so-called two-tier model, which he says would equate the rise of the cult of the saints with the capitulation by the enlightened elites of the Christian church to modes of thought previously current only among the vulgar. Brown cites with approval his mentor, the great classical historian, uh, Momigliano at the conclusion of a similar project. Thus, my inquest into the popular beliefs in the late Roman historians ends in reporting that there were no such beliefs. Whether or not we wish to use terms like folklore and magic, or popular beliefs for that matter, Loomis's compendium is certainly useful. But taxonomy is not explanation. To categorize is a helpful first step, but it is a first step. What can we do once we have listed our motifs? 
I would now like to look at an example of a narrative motif, uh, one which occurs frequently in miracle stories, exploring a family likeness in Jessup's words. I will give three examples of it, and some of which follows is direct citation, some is paraphrase. At some time in the 1140s, uh, a young Norfolk shepherd fell asleep under a bush while tending his flock. While he was snoring with his mouth open, a snake suddenly entered into him, and as if it had found an agreeable dwelling, made its way into his intestines. When he awoke, he was unaware of what had happened, but felt discomfort and spent some years in increasing pain. Finally, in 1151, his father brought him to the shrine of St. William of Norwich, scraped some stone from the shrine and gave it to his son to drink in the water. When the holy water reached the snake in his guts, it went mad. The pain increased, the boy ran out of the church and vomited up not only the snake, but also its two young. The father killed the three snakes and preserved them in a cleft stick as a sign of such a great miracle. Nauseous details indeed. Another story comes from the miracles of St. Verdiana of Castelfiorentino, a Tuscan recluse who died, it seems, in the first half of the 13th century. The miracle story seems to be 14th century. A certain gardener of Florence, tired by his long labour, lay down under a tree and went to sleep with his mouth open. A snake crept into his mouth. He felt there was something that was disturbing his intestines and woke up. He cried out terribly, especially after his body began to swell up. The various remedies suggested by doctors were in vain. At length, as many people suggested, he invoked St. Verdiana, imploring her help in his need. After many vows and prayers, he was carried to the church of St. Verdiana and placed before her altar. As he entered the church, he immediately refrained from calling out and from the uncouth expression of his pain. And when he stood by the saint's altar, he bent down, opened his mouth, and the snake rushed out, splattered with bloody matter. Health returned to the man. The third example is different in that it concerns an in vita miracle, a life, a miracle in the saint's lifetime. The saint who performs the miracle is Pavasius or Pavin, an early, that is a fourth century bishop of Le Mans, although the text is much later. A peasant from Anjou went out to harvest and tired by his labor had a nap after eating. While he slept with his mouth open, a snake entered through his mouth into his belly. When he awoke, he did not at first know he had a snake in his belly but nevertheless felt a terrible bellyache. That night, as he slept in his bed, the snake began to move about and cause him great pain. His cries brought his neighbours, who sent for doctors, but they could do him no good. They, they, uh, they never do in uh, miracle stories. Um, he, he began to frequent churches to seek healing, and one night in a dream was told to go to St. Pavasius, Bishop of Le Mans. Pavasius understood the nature of his ailment, touched his belly, made the sign of the cross, and put his finger in the man's mouth. He at once vomited up the snake. These are only three examples of dozens one could cite. Loomis alone in White Magic has 18 indexed under snake swallowed. What can we deduce from these stories? Um, first of all, of course, the danger of sleeping outdoors with your mouth open. <laughs> But um, beyond that salutary lesson, there are forking paths. Uh, one could be called realist, the other literary. They're not mutually exclusive, but take different starting points. The realist assumption is that there are numerous narratives of this kind because the situation they describe often happened. For example, uh, parasitic worms must have been widespread in the medieval period, and they can certainly exit through the mouth. Uh, if people saw this happen at a shrine, they would then need an explanation for how they had entered in the first place. The literary approach, in contrast, starts with the fact that there are many stories of this kind and approaches them as narratives. And in parallel to this, several large issues in medieval history have been characterized by this tension between these two interpretative styles. They are interpretative styles. Are our texts, in any sense, lenses through which we can see? Or can we only ever see the text? For example, is the indigenous European paganism of the early Middle Ages a lived world view? 
or largely a textual construct embodied in stereotyped Christian writings that give us only, uh, in the words of James Palmer, who's written on this, elaborate imaginings of paganism? Is the heresy of the High Middle Ages virtually an alternative religion of dissent and opposition? Or is it, in the view expressed by R.I. Moore, contrived from the resources of the well-stocked imaginations of churchmen? The, and the arresting similarity of those two formulations underlines the problem, which is the degree of self-referentiality of the texts. Is all that the texts reveal the imaginings of their authors? This may be one reason why the study of the rewriting of hagiography, uh, a scholarly method that Monique Goulet in particular has developed over the past decade or so, has proved attractive. Rewriting is a pure experimental environment for the literary approach. Changes from one version to another of a text highlight what the second author wanted to do. The omissions, rewordings, and additions are clearly purposeful. So when studying hagiography, it's often difficult to decide the relative weight of literary model and recurrent social situation. On occasion, the hagiographer helps with an explicit reference as in the case of the quarrel between the men of Gloucester and the men of Worcester over who should possess the holy body of St. Kennel, where the author comments, both sides wrangled as once the people of Tours and Poitiers did over the body of St. Martin. So we do know what this writer had in mind, but it does not mean that the incident did not occur, simply because there's reference to a literary antecedent, nor that we are absolved by identifying a literary trope from exploring the reality of a dispute like this one over the bodies of the holy dead. To go back to our case of the swallowed snakes, uh, some things can be excluded. There is no ur text, no original text casting a long shadow. Uh, the Bible, of course, and the great influential hagiographies like the lives of Antony or Martin left a deep imprint on all medieval writing about the saints. And if we read of resurrections or water changed into wine, we may well first wish to tease out our textual relations. But the swallowed snake story does not come from such sources. Nor is mutual influence at all likely. The three stories are found in texts written in the Carolingian Empire, in 12th century England, and in late medieval Italy. Uh, there's, no, there's no chance of an Irish example for, for obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> None, none, of, none of these texts had a wide circulation, and there is no conceivable influence of one on the others. Does anything about the saints involved help clarify the motif? William of Norwich is not a saint specialist. He does cure one other beneficiary of snake bite, but that makes only two miracles out of 120 or so. William of Norwich is notorious as the earliest recorded case of a Christian boy supposedly ritually murdered by the Jews, the so-called blood libel. Uh, but his miracles are actually fairly usual, the usual run of cures. Uh, although he does have a rather vicious streak as well, striking down doubters or lukewarm followers. Pavasius of Le Mans, the, the other second of these saints I was talking about, is renowned for having expelled a dangerous fire-breathing dragon 10 cubits long, termed also serpens, so perhaps this is relevant to snakes. He's classified as PV1 in the dragon classification system. Everyone likes to classify things. There is now a dragon classification system developed by the old English scholar Christina Rauer. PV1 is Pavasius' uh, expulsion of the fire-breathing dragon. But most of Pavasius' miracles are not so dramatic and involve the cure of general ailments. It is Verdiana, however, the Italian saint, the third example, who provides the clearest case of association of saint and snakes. She actually lived with them. Having heard in a sermon that St. Anthony of Egypt had been tormented by demons in animal form, she prayed to God that she might undergo a similar kind of suffering. In due course, two horrible serpents slithered into her cell. Her life 
the account of her life describes her as being horrified since she knew that the snake is the demon's familiar animal. I do not know whether this implies that she had forgotten her prayers to suffer like St. Anthony or that she was unpleasantly surprised by the answer to her prayer. The snake stayed with her for a long time, although often going out and returning, but they were never absent when she took a frugal meal which they shared with her, eating from the same plate. However, if there was not enough to eat, they became angry and beat her so fiercely with their tails that she could not get up for days. Verdiana nevertheless regarded the snakes as fruitful company and forbade the Bishop of Florence from getting rid of them. Eventually, however, the local people killed one and drove off the other, much to the saint's regret, deprived of the company that had been divinely sent. It is thus not surprising that in her late medieval iconography, St. Verdiana is represented with snakes, as on a 14th century embroidered textile, now in the Victoria and Albert Museum. A painting by Giovanni Dal Ponte from around 1420 depicts her standing, dressed in a nun's habit, holding a snake in each hand. Moreover, a late 15th century writer testifies that by her prayers, many have been cured of snake bites, both when she lived in this present life and afterwards. There was even a snake's skull amongst her relics. What kind of analysis can we apply here when we ponder stories of snake swallowed? Clearly, things coming into or out of the body are not matters indifferent to human beings. But following Stith Thompson's austere refusal to determine the psychological basis of various moti motifs, I refrain from even mentioning the, the, uh, what is vulgarly called a Freudian explanation of these snakes. Nor will I invoke the Minoan snake goddess. But it is not nonsensical to ask if the cure of the Florentine gardener who swallowed a snake belongs in some way appropriately to a saint who was so intimate with snakes. Verdiana clearly had a long-standing association with snakes, as Pavasius, or most definitely William of Norwich, did not. And this is where the fact that the expulsion of swallowed snakes is such a frequent motif in miracle accounts is important. It warns us against premature over-interpretation of a case like this. The expulsion of swallowed snakes is a common motif. Some of the saints who perform the miraculous expulsion have a snake association, and some do not. This is the pattern we're trying to explain. It is not as if motif analysis provided a master key. My case study of an individual miracle account with which I conclude is drawn from Reginald of Durham's uh, little book on the powers and miracles of the glorious Bishop Cuthbert, a text which was edited by James Rain the Elder in the very first volume of the Surtees Society in 1835 and sadly has never been translated. More happily, Reginald's own autograph manuscript survives, still in Durham, where it was written. Uh, it's a small book, less than six inches high and just over four inches wide, uh, 15 by 10.7 centimetres, if there are any French people in the audience, um, consisting of 166 folios. It must have been composed over several years since it's dedicated to Aylred of Riveau, who died in 1167, as I mentioned earlier, while its final pages describe events during the Scots invasions of 1173 to 4. The book is a collection of 129 miracle stories, some of them dating back to early, earlier centuries, but the majority from Reginald's own lifetime. The average length of these tales is 700 words, so the longer of them have a real chance to develop narrative momentum and variety. I will look at one in detail. Reginald's characteristic form is to open a chapter with some general elevated comments about his saintly patron, Cuthbert, before getting down to business. The story I have selected, which is chapter 68 of this work, begins in just this way. St. Cuthbert shines forth with the scent of the brightest incense, which glows on the outside, but while it is burned up with flames, is shown as good by its sweet vapours. His brightness gleams with justice. His sweet smell shines forth in the minds of hearers through his works of virtue. Reginald continues for a while with this ambitious 
and indeed paradoxical mingling of visual and olfactory imagery. Cuthbert is both the fire of love and the fragrance of eternal sweetness. Before reaching a narrative marker uh, that could be read in such a way as to sound pathetic, there is a village in Cheshire. But the concreteness of the detail is a consistent feature of Reginald's narratives. The grandiose introits are not undercut by the everyday elements that follow, but are buttressed and illustrated by them. So, we are told the name of the village. It is Leighton in the Wirral near Liverpool, uh, given a brief account of its location, and then informed that it has a little church dedicated to St Cuthbert. The marshalling of miracle stories from many subsidiary centres of Cuthbert's cult is a feature of Reginald's collection, supporting his assertion that Cuthbert's power could be felt everywhere, not just at his shrine, his main shrine at Durham. Uh, and this miracle is in fact the first of a group of five reported from the region of the Wirral. This particular miracle centres on the church itself, a humble little building, according to Reginald, built of rough wattles and situated in remote woodland, rarely visited by the locals who had no particular devotion to St Cuthbert. This was all about to change. Not long afterwards, the venerable confessor, Cuthbert, announced to all of what great merit he was. He who until then had seemed almost unknown to the inhabitants and of no honour among them. This builds up a little suspense. Something's going to happen, even if the drift will come as no particular surprise in a book entitled The Miraculous Deeds of St Cuthbert. Um, then we switch to straightforward narrative. It happened that a crow built a nest in the roof of the church, as it did each year. The crow has young, and their croaking, vox stridula, I translate as croaking, uh, bothers the locals. An ill-mannered young man then climbs up onto the roof to get rid of the crows, making holes in the rotting wood of the structure as he does so. But he doesn't care. Switching to direct speech, Reginald gives us the young man's blasphemous words to the birds. Cuthbert's roof won't be any protection for you, and his church will be no help for you against me. Such disrespect for a saint's name has inevitable consequences. While the young man reached towards the nest with one hand, and with the other grasped one of the wooden pegs that held the wattle in place, suddenly the whole section came crashing down bringing him with it half dead. The wooden peg he was holding adheres to his hand and cannot be released. Reginald gives a detailed description of the state of the hand introduced by a direct address, a direct address to the reader or hearer, vide res, you would see. Uh, doctors, of course, are useless, but eventually advised by his friends, the suffering young man has himself carried into Cuthbert's church, where he spends three days how many miracles require three days, uh, penitently begging Cuthbert's forgiveness. A vigorous description of his symptoms allows Reginald to deploy a rich vocabulary of bodily semi-medical terms, nervi, humor, veni, etc., showing a, a feature that is not uncommon in miracle accounts, despite their avowed stance of hostility to actual doctors. Reginald's contemporary, uh, William of Canterbury, recorder of Beckett's miracles, has also been characterised by the richness of his medical terminology. On the third night, while the miserable young man lies awake in the church, a light bursts forth and a venerable bishop appears. His physiognomy and clothing are described in detail. The youth's teeth chatter, his limbs shake. The bishop takes him by the arm and addresses him gently. You have been punished for your thoughtless act and suffered not the vengeful anger of Cuthbert, whom you reproached and whose peace you violated, but rather the true reward of your idiocy. Cuthbert explains that he is more used to mercy than revenge and proceeds to heal the young man by banging his paralyzed fingers against the altar, first healing his index finger, then his middle finger, then his medical finger, as it was known, but the little finger, called the ear finger for some reason, uh, was, left, was left contracted as a reminder to him. Cuthbert disappears. The young man reports the miracle to the priest and all the local people. The place gains great honour. And at some point, the priest and some of the aged parishioners turn up at Durham to tell Reginald the whole story. 
So great is St. Cuthbert in a distant land, he concludes, who shows with his wonderful miracles that he is everywhere. A social historical analysis of this miracle account would quite rightly point out that it concerns a young man, that it's a punishment miracle, although also, of course, a healing miracle, that it takes place away from the main cult center, etc. All vital information. But it also has narratological features. The length of the narrative, about 1,200 words, the amount of direct speech, the extended physical descriptions, and notably the presence of the narrator telling us what is coming, labelling the youth's words as blasphemous, showing us the wound, videres, explaining how he knows the story. Reginald of Durham obviously does not feel the pressure weighing heavily on Walter Daniel, with whom I started at the very moment, to name names. The youth remains an anonymous youth. The bearers of the story are simply the priest and other ancient men parishioners of that church. Neither Walter Daniel's critics nor papal commissioners in a canonization hearing would have put up with that. As mentioned in the conclusion to this account, Reginald says that because of this miracle, the place came to be treated with much more honor. And in fact, we learn in one of the later miracle accounts from this group of five local stories that the humble church of Wattle and Thatch was completely rebuilt in well-fashioned stone. As a short story writer, Reginald of Durham stands comparison with the greats. So to sum up these three suggested approaches, we might find it useful to place our miracle narratives along a range or scale from literary to forensic, the generally persuasive to the more formally probative. We might also weigh up what we mean by motif and look at individual stories to see how characteristic or how unusual certain motifs are. And we might attempt close reading of the literary gems that miracle accounts sometimes offer. These are just a few angles of approach to what is one of the most enormous bodies of written material to have come down to us from the Middle Ages. There's no shortage of materials, nor of possible methods of analysis. Uh, that is what is so exciting. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bartlett, for, for a really fascinating lecture uh, in which I don't think I've ever seen hagiography and herpetology rhyme so well in, uh, in, in, in one presentation. Um, so now it comes to the opportunity for questions uh, or comments, and I will invite Professor Bartlett back to the microphone here, and I might maybe take... Uh, center there to, to actually take any questions. If you just raise your hand, if you have any questions or comments uh, for Professor Bartley. Thank you very much. They're all convinced. much indeed. That was a most uh, wonderful talk. I was just wondering, um, I'm, I'm sure you, you, you would know you would know this, are there kind of regional patterns or, you know, mark changes across countries in these types of stories? Yes, I, I think there are regional patterns in several senses. Um, one is in simply in terms of substance and the kind of stories you get. Um, Spain, for example, has a whole genre of saints who are um, saving people who have been captured by Muslims. So, so you have a Christian Muslim frontier and you have the saints specialising in that kind of activity. Uh, and that could be found in many different places. Um, and I think um, uh, you'd obviously find um, in urban, amongst urban saints, greater occurrence of things involving money and commerce and so on, things like that. So, so the social environment will, will affect what you might call the, the substance of, of the miracle. Um, but I think it's probably the case to say, and I, I would really need to think about this more, I think there probably are literary traditions of the kind, the kind, of, the kind of writing. 
I'm afraid to talk about Irish saints here, but uh, <laughs> I think if you, if you read um, the lives of Irish saints, I, I, I can only read the Latin ones, sadly, um, you do get um, different style, um, and ju just, to take, just to take one instance where I think it's uh, accurate to say this, amongst all the miracles and wonders and amazing things that occur in, in, in hagiographic literature, animal-human metamorphosis is very rare. And animal-human metamorphosis is known in other medieval narrative accounts, and of course it's got classical roots and so on. Uh, and, the, and the places where you can find it seem to me uh, Irish or Irish influence stories. Patrick, Patrick has one, and there are, and there are others. Um, the, mir the miracles of Reginald of, of, of Cuthbert have one dramatic story in which it's the time when Cuthbert's uh, relics are being wandering around after, after Lindisfarne has been sacked by the Vikings. And they, um, there's a group of loyal followers, and they have Cuthbert's body, but not much else. Uh, they have got a nice cheese. Uh, which they're looking forward to having for supper. Uh, but when they go to look for the cheese, it's gone. And they suspect one of the followers of St. Cuthbert of having pinched the cheese when they were asleep. And they pray to God to turn the thief into a fox. And they suddenly notice that one of their number is missing, but there's a little fox running around. Uh, you know, this, this is not typical miracle stuff. Cuthbert is very strongly influenced by Irish traditions and uh, his, 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 his background, his hagiography is Irish. So I think you might find something like that if you're saying, where is human animal metamorphosis? You might, I mean, this, this is entirely hypothetical. I mean, some of the things I was looking at in, in, at the end there in the case study, um, amount of direct speech, uh, you know, I think if you, you are, I, I haven't done it, but I think it's, it's not beyond the wit of human beings to go through this stuff and say, look, there is this amount of, of direct speech in this one, this amount of direct speech in this one. You could do that, and then the patterns would come up. Maybe they'd be regional, maybe they'd be chronological. But you could, you could certainly imagine that. Yeah. I think it did. I think it did. Uh, and in a way, it increases the amount of material enormously because um, you now have a, a centralized and extremely bureaucratic system uh, quizzing people and keeping records and sometimes quizzing the same people twice and cross referencing and so on. So you've got the enormous procedure that that papal canonization produces. It really produces a load of stuff. Um, we don't have very much um, of the, not very much has survived of the canonization records of St. Louis in the late 13th century, but we do know when they moved the venue of the hearings at one point, they needed uh, 20 donkeys to carry all the documentation. So that's, that's, the, that, that's what is being produced. That's why I think historians actually rather like papal canonization, because it produces a whole load of written material. But at the same time, the narratives, to my mind, tend to get a, um, often, unless they're, unless they're very long narratives, which you get sometimes, they tend to get a little bit flattened. They tend to get a little bit more stereotyped. Um, many of the more outré miracles that you find uh, either in the early Middle Ages or in hagiographic record that hasn't been is not intended for um, uh, canonization uh, inquests, um, that other stuff goes. On the other hand, what you, what you often have, and this is um, something that is really quite exciting, I, I think. Um, Salvador mentioned it when he, in his kind introduction, I wrote a book called The Hangman. And The Hangman is just a short book which looks at one miracle, one miracle from one canonization process, because we have uh, nine different accounts of it. Because, of course, they're, they're calling in people for a, a wit witnesses to this miracle, and they want as many witnesses as they can get. And so you suddenly get this multiple uh, account of one miracle. And the differences between the different witnesses and what they say and the, the, the discrepancies and what they highlight makes uh, for, you can construct quite an interesting multiple narrative out of that. So you do get that. And the multiple narrative perspective is something that most hagiography doesn't have. Most hagiography um, has either what literary historians would call an omniscient narrator, that is, the person telling the story seems somehow or other to know everything, even what people are thinking, you know, 
uh, or um, sometimes, as in Reginald's case here, you have something that reads like an omniscient narrator, but right at the end they give you their credentials of how they learned it. And I was told this by X. Yeah. So you've you've got in in paper canonization, I mean, put put simply, an enormous increase in volume, a slight flattening of tone and variety, but the possibility of multiple perspectives. Is there, is there much documentation for to disprove the process of paper canonization? Has any study been undertaken how that affects that? Yes, yes, the, the um, paper commissioners were expected to bring a certain skepticism to the material. And um, they often did so. Uh, and some of the standard, there, there are standard questions that are meant to be asked. And some of the questions obviously have, lurking in the background, alternative explanations. Could this miracle, they say, okay, could this cure, let's take a cure, which is the most common kind. Could this cure have been natural? Could it have been done by invocation of uh, occult, purpose, occult qualities of stones? Were doctors involved? Yeah? So they'll go through, and the attempt is very much to sort of exclude all the alternative possibilities uh, of it being miraculous. And then there are certain things that are quite interestingly borderline. I, I mentioned the, the need that people had to distinguish miracle and magic. And one of the one scholastic definition of, of miracle, a proper miracle, was that it was something that wasn't done just by the force of the words. So obviously the category of something like an efficacious charm, an efficacious verbal charm, was present in people's minds, and that didn't count as a miracle. And that's one of the things they're trying to exclude. So they have this, and then they, they, they just have a sometimes a kind of quizzing, sort of uh, cross-examining kind of approach. Uh, and because of what everything is written down, they can often go back to something that was written a month before. And they'll say, oh, well, on this, on this occasion it was said that X, and so on and so forth. Even tiny little things like, you know, someone in, in this, and I was looking at the, um, the hangman, that's based on the canonization process of Thomas of Cantaloupe, who was Bishop of Hereford. And at one point someone says, and then I invoked um, a saint, and a, a bright figure appeared and said, I am St. Thomas. And the, the commissioners say, well, how did you know which St. Thomas it is? Isn't there? There's Thomas Apostle, isn't there? And there's Thomas Beckett and Thomas the Martyr. So how do you know there was this Thomas? So the, these kind of, they're meant to be there not to encourage the uh, witnesses uh, without any reservations, but to quiz them. And that's, that's what they do. In, in this quizzing, was there also a kind of intertextual approach uh, that the that the commissioners actually looked at other at other accounts, written accounts of, of miracles, and said, "Well, actually, that was written before. You, you're just citing a, a, a stereotype. You're citing a motif. Have you been in, in, influenced by by a tale that you heard yourself?" Um, I've never come across a specific reference to that, but the uh, amount of material is so vast that it would be quite possible that there, there is something like that. Um, what they do tend to try and exclude um, is um, collaborative uh, activity between the different witnesses. They, they, in fact, sometimes you, the witnesses have to swear on oath that they haven't made up their stories or constructed their testimony in collaboration with other people. Uh, and we know for a fact that, of course, that many times the, the witnesses would know each other and they talk over things. And very often the, the miraculous event that's being investigated will have taken place a long time earlier. And they'll, of course, they'll have talked to each other. Uh, and sometimes you can even see um, little telltale similarities of phrasing or something, as if they've all agreed that that's how they're going to say it. Um, but I've never come across the specific in the instance that you, you've talked about. And, it, and it's partly, of course, that for... Um, for many of the, for, well, I think for all of the papal commissioners, the idea that a modern day miracle, one that they're investigating, might have either biblical or other hagiographical parallels wouldn't be an objection at all. Because of course they saw these things as recurrent um, uh, expressions of divine power that were, were recurrent. And so you'd, you'd say, when it's, a, it's actually a thing that they, they would actually might even highlight in hagiography. Just as, it's a little, I cited a tiny example there. The, the, the people are quarreling, Gloucester and Worcester guys are quarreling over this holy body. And the hagiographer says, just as the people of Tours and Poitiers quarreled over St. Martin. It doesn't invalidate this 
in a way, it's because you're saying that miracle is a recurrent and uh, you, you embrace the stereotype in a way, you say, yes, that's, that's quite right. So it just remains for me to um, to offer a, a final word of thanks to our guest lecturer this evening uh, for what was really a fascinating and very engaging lecture. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for for agreeing to come to Maynooth and for gracing us with with your presence and with your scholarship. And we do hope that it won't be your last visit here either. You'd be always very welcome back. So I hope you'll join me in thanking once again Professor Robert Bartlett for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you.